there are there are some big projects that are going to have going to have to happen eventually, uh, mainly roads and, and railroads and rights of way. How hard is that going to be to do? I mean, are you going to have to deal with fourteen or fifteen hundred people to get thirty miles of railroad built? Uh, Depends on which uh, thirty is there, miles. Is there, is, there, is there any form of imminent domain? Nuremberg to first available. If if they want eminent domain, the United States of Europe Parliament is going to have to pass an eminent domain law because they do not have eminent domain in the sense that we think of it. Yeah. Now, you could, if at the time, if you were sufficiently determined, get hold of the land for what you wanted. That is, if a ruler decided he was going to build a fort in a certain place, basically he would simply go in and buy out everybody's rights. Uh, normally, however, he had to provide an alternative place for them to go, which is why, as I said, occasionally at this period you find these neat little square villages with the church right in the middle of the square and straight streets. Uh, they are new villages founded by somebody who had to relocate a village because he was putting somebody, something else on the spot where it was originally located. And the people there looked at him and said, all right, you want our spot? You give us leases in an equivalent spot from some of your uh, own land and uh, make it worth our while. So, so for example, the you know one of the stories you, you deal with lease rights and weir rights mm -hmm. and transportation rights on the river is that a, uh, an adequate substitute for a thought of how that they're going to have to negotiate to put roads in? Uh, it really is. Uh, now, one thing is that for a good road. They, by and large, the people who will be living along the road will be willing to make accommodations because the road will bring additional income in. Uh, a good road will make it possible for the village to have a couple of more nice inns and uh, you know, basically a good road is a money-making opportunity. And a railroad station is a railroad is going railroad station is going to be any more so. What you're going to find is that as a railroad goes through though, what the villagers are going to negotiate is when we need you, you stop here. Railroads are not going to be no, not so much have a station. But, but what they're going to want is that if they have produce or grain that they want moved to the nearest town for market, they want the right to be able to flag the train down, load it on as it passes through at their convenience, and uh, then send it on its way. Uh, which means that uh, train travel is not going to be hot speed. Or at least not the uh, the peddler freight that's assigned to pick up villagers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I envision I envision long, difficult negotiations to do anything. Yes, uh, the, this is the basic truth that the in a really authoritarian society, you don't have as many long, difficult negotiations. The price you pay for popular participation in government is eternal negotiations. Oh. But they also ran into, even in this country, mm -hmm. they would say, well, you don't want to be cooperative. We'll go to the next village. You know, you oh, yeah. Move your, oh. You move your plan a little bit. She wrote that story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bypass surgery. <laughs> Bypass surgery. <laughs> yes, uh, that's the way they'll do it uh, a lot of the time. But basically, they're going to have to get someone's agreement. Uh, they had to. They had to negotiate with the people they ran the bypass through. Uh, and somebody said, well, why didn't you, in your story, run the by why did you run the bypass there? It would have been much more engineeringly efficient to run the bypass here. And I said, because here, 
was did not happen to be within the state of Thuringia Franconia. It was right over the border, and the state had no authority to negotiate a bypass this guy. through it. Those books. We got to. They're all gone. They're all gone. Ah, darn. What the series is, to be perfectly honest, that we're discussing. 1632. That was why the date is important. Okay. Okay. Um, so my question is in the absence of these strong, powerful, Identified himself first with his village or town. Mm -hmm. Not so much to a lord, although at this time, uh, I think I had some statistics earlier. Uh, there were, in what we now think of as Germany, mm -hmm. and which I refer to for this period as the Germanies, mm -hmm. about 1,400 separate and distinct independent political entities. No. Well, well, that well was a, um. That was a he did have more switching states. Yeah, let, let me back up a little. We're a century beyond the Reformation. Okay. So by this point, <coughs> Germany is religiously organized under the provisions of the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. The Peace of Augsburg of 1555 determined that the ruler of a territory could determine the religion of that territory, be it Catholic or Lutheran. Only Catholic or Lutheran were comprised in the Peace of Augsburg. Calvinism in the interval, however, Calvinism had become strong and influential, and a number of very uh, significant territory, such as the Palatinate or uh, Lippe, had become Calvinist. At, the, at this point, the Calvinist territories are tolerated but don't have a legal right to exist. It's one of those things. Uh, they are influential enough that nobody wants to tackle them, but should anybody tackle them, they don't have a legal way to stand on one way or the other. Now, of the 1,400 or thereabouts independent territories, a good half belonged to a category that existed almost entirely in the south and southwest, Swabia and Franconia, called Imperial Knights. The 700 odd Imperial Knights in total did not hold more than 250 square miles of territory. They were an anomalous leftover from the Middle Ages. Uh, they didn't even, each of them anymore, have a seat in the Imperial Diet, in the Imperial Legislature. There was what was called the bench of knights and the imperial knights got to elect one delegate to represent all of them. Uh, the same is true for the small independent uh, religious territories such as the uh, Abbey of Kempton down there in the southwest. There was a bench of prelates and the abbots and abbesses got to <coughs> elect get together and elect one person to represent them in the imperial legislature. So that took care of about <coughs> a thousand 
of the 1400 independent entities, which left you the imperial cities, which were cities that had a charter from the emperor as distinct from cities which had a charter from a local ruler. Uh, they had a bench of cities now. Uh, they got to elect one representative for them, which gets you down to the uh, 60, 65 reasonably identifiable territories on a map. Places you've heard of. Hesse, Brunswick, Mecklenburg, Pomerania, you know, the Württemberg, Baden, uh, the larger principalities, uh, each of whose uh, rulers had his own seat in the imperial diet, the imperial legislature. Uh, of those, uh, seven were the prince electors who elected a Holy Roman Emperor when the last one uh, died. The electors were obviously the most influential of the territorial rulers. So that's the basic political structure you're working within. Uh, of the cities, uh, Nuremberg, Augsburg, uh, Frankfurt, Hamburg had populations in the region from uh, 40,000 to 60,000, depending on when the last plague went through. Uh, most of the other larger towns uh, didn't, Magdeburg had had a population that large earlier, but it was down by the 1630s because of uh, plague. Uh, most of the other larger towns weren't over 20,000. The great majority of German towns uh, weren't over 10,000. You didn't have any massive national capital like uh, London had for England or Paris had for France. Uh, you didn't have, have any big secondary towns such as Marseille in France or Naples in Italy. Uh, nothing up to 300,000, 500,000. Uh, the towns or the cities were small. But the countryside was fairly well populated. Yeah, the countryside was fairly densely populated. It was a much more even distribution. For, for example, uh, for example, Nuremberg was the imperial city, the seat of the imperial diet. It was a very important town. And I can tell you from personal experience that it takes about 12 to 13 minutes to walk from one end of the old town in Nuremberg to the other end. From the city walls to the city walls. Yeah, yeah. that was what I pointed out too when we did the Bavarian crisis. I pointed out that Munich, the capital of Bavaria at this time, could be walked across briskly in 15 minutes from mm -hmm. city wall to city wall. Uh, of course, people were really crammed inside those city walls. Uh, uh, if you think today you live in your neighbor's pocket, you haven't tried <laughs> a medieval city. How big was Nuremberg at that time? About 50,000. Yeah. But, and the other thing is, there's an ancient saying, ancient being, in relative terms, to having to do with, since it has to do with Americans, but, but there's a saying that says, Europeans think 100 miles is a long ways, and Americans think 100 years is a long time. <laughs> okay? And um, it's just amazing when you get into Germany and you drive through the river valleys and you see, you know, Without, you could stop the car and see a village over there, and see a village over there, and see a castle on that hill, and see a castle on this hill. That's what 